Hi everyone, I'm Donnie. I'm a developer at PagerDuty, and I'm one of the people who investigate outages to figure out what went wrong and what we need to do to fix it. Today I'm going to tell you about one outage that we had, or one uh, problem that we had with Zookeeper that caused several different outages for us. Uh, can I get a show of hands? How many people have heard of PagerDuty? Okay, some. Not bad. Um, our core tool is basically an alerting tool. So usually you have a lot of different monitoring systems. What they do is they send an event to us, and then our software will call or text or email your developers or your ops people who are on call to let them know that you had a problem so that you can fix it. And we also have uh, a bunch of other tools for doing incident management to help you organize large-scale responses around uh, when you have these kinds of outages. Now, because we're the ones that you have to rely on when your software has problems, we care about high availability a lot. So, one of the tools that we use for that is Zookeeper. How many of you know about Zookeeper? Have used it or heard of it? Okay, a decent number, good. Uh, Zookeeper is a distributed system which is useful for building other distributed systems. So what it gives you is you can think of it as a small in-memory file system, or you can think of it as just kind of a hierarchical key value store. Um, and the idea is that you don't store regular files in it, you store little bits of configuration information. The API that it gives to you, uh, it gives you lots of different things, like you can create a directory, you can create a file, you can atomically update a file, you can watch a file for changes, you can create an ephemeral file, so that's a file that will go away whenever the client disconnects from Zookeeper. Or you can create a sequential file. This is one where if you have multiple clients that try to create the same file name at the same time, uh, it will add an ID to it, uh, an ordered ID. And the idea is that you take this and you build other higher level primitives on top of it. So you can use it for leader election. You can have multiple machines try to create the same file, and whichever one gets it, that one is the leader. You could use it for service discovery by creating one of these ephemeral files where the value is your IP address and port, and then whenever you're offline, that's going to go away. And the one that we mainly use it for is this last one, the sequential file. You can use that to build up different concurrency primitives like semaphores and locks and it's distributed locking that uh, we mainly use it for at PagerDuty. One of the tools that we use, we have a lot of different services that use Cassandra for a database. And Cassandra is pretty nice overall. It's highly available, it's scalable. But one of the things that it doesn't give you is any real transactions, meaning like an ACID transaction that you might be used to if you use a regular SQL database. Instead, you just give it writes and it will do them kind of at the same time. You can overwrite data uh, and it doesn't really give you a lot of easy ways of dealing with that. Um, if you're interested in some of those issues, I gave a talk earlier this year at Cassandra Summit. And if you think about Cassandra, it's not, uh, a lot of people think about kind of eventual consistency. You do everything and it will eventually happen. But there's a lot of uh, kind of weirder anomalies that can happen if you really dig deep and really kind of look at what's going on. So if you're interested in that, you can uh, take a look at that talk. But the, uh, the benefit of using Zookeeper with Cassandra, for us at least, is that we can take a distributed lock. And when I say a distributed lock, I mean this is a lock that is PagerDuty wide. And we would take it on some uh, entity or maybe on a user's data, and that will guarantee us that none of the other machines that we have well, or only one of the machines that we have will try to operate on that data at one time. And it's not as good as having actual transactions, but it does help quite a bit. You get at least some level of isolation. And Zookeeper is pretty useful for doing that because it, uh, and it, it's, or wait, we like using Zookeeper for that because it's highly available. One uh, weird or uncommon setup that we have at PagerDuty is that we actually run our cluster over a wide area network. Now, um, this is for our Cassandra cluster as well as our Zookeeper cluster. We just have one big cluster that we run in multiple data centers and in fact, even over multiple providers. And actually it's one cluster per, per service that we have. So not just one, but uh, 
sets of one, but all of them run across multiple data centers with a, a decent amount of latency between them, about 24 milliseconds in our furthest data centers. And uh, the problem that I'm going to talk about today was kind of because of running it over a wide area network, but in general, it does work. And Cassandra as well does work like this. A little bit about uh, how Zookeeper works. You run a Zookeeper uh, service as a cluster. So you have multiple servers. They're all running the Zookeeper software. They all have an entire copy of the database. And the, the database in this case is going to be usually pretty small because you're not storing real data in it. You're just storing kind of small amounts of configuration or coordination information. So every uh, Zookeeper node has a full copy of the database. And they elect one server to be the leader. As a client, you can talk to any replica in Zookeeper and perform reads. And you can perform writes as well, but those writes are just going to be forward to whichever node is the leader. That's how Zookeeper gives you the um, that's how it gives you the ordering guarantees that it has and the consistency guarantees. Now, this generally works, uh, but in our case, we had uh, a series of failures that happened. They, they followed a couple of different patterns. So the main pattern, what happened was we had some kind of network trouble, meaning packet loss or latency, and then the Zookeeper cluster would get stuck. So at uh, point number one, uh, this is a graph, by the way, of the, the size of the database, so the number of items in it, and regular jagged lines are good, and flat line is bad. What would happen is uh, one of the followers would fall behind the leader. So it's supposed to have a full copy of the database, but instead it didn't have all the replicas or all, all the items in the database. And then a little while after that, the entire cluster would lock up. That's at point two where everything is uh, everything has flatlined. Uh, the other pattern that this followed was pretty similar. At point one, you have a follower that uh, fell behind. At point two, the entire cluster fell behind. But at point 1.5, that's where the leader actually fell behind the rest of the cluster. And this might seem really weird if you've worked with any kind of uh, leader-based systems. Usually, the leader is supposed to be up to date. But in this case, that's actually OK. Anytime you have one of these leader-based systems where you're replicating data to all these other nodes, if you don't explicitly check that the leader has the data that you're trying to replicate, then you could end up with a situation where the followers have more up-to-date information that the leader hasn't yet applied, because it replicated the data out, but it didn't actually apply it to its own uh, in-memory copy. Uh, but in, in the case of Zookeeper, this is actually OK, and that isn't the real problem. The problem is at number two, where we have this flat line. Now, to, to recover from this situation, initially what we had tried uh, was just restarting all the nodes in the cluster. And then when it came back up, it was fine. So that, that actually did recover. But later on, when this outage had happened later times, or th this uh, similar pattern, we tried restarting just the leader. And we found that that actually worked. Um, so we didn't need to restart all the nodes. We just needed to restart the, the leader to get, it to the, get the cluster to recover. Now, we had spent quite a lot of time investigating this. Uh, we were not really making much progress. Uh, and the first hint that we had to try to figure out what was going on here was this log line on the leader. Too busy to snap, skipping. Now, what this is is Zookeeper replicates all the data from the leader to all the followers. And it keeps uh, a transaction log of all the operations that have happened. And it also keeps a snapshot. Every once in a while, it will just write out the entire uh, state of the database to disk so that it will be able to recover faster. And th this, is a, you know, th this takes not very much time because the entire database is, in our case, less than a megabyte. But if it's already in the process of writing out one of these snapshots, when it goes to write it out a second time, it won't write them in parallel. Instead, it will just skip the second one, and it will wait for the first one to finish, and it logs this line that it was too busy to take a snapshot. So we decided to try out some fault injection, trying to replicate this. 
there's a tool that we used which is pretty useful called SSHFS. You can use this to mount a, uh, a remote directory of any server that you have SSH access to. You can mount it locally, then you can point Zookeeper's data directory at that folder or that directory. And then you can use all the tools that uh, you use for messing with the network, like IP tables or TC, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And you can use those. And even though you're messing with the network, those show up as disk problems. So you can make the disk appear to, to be slow or to hang completely. And when we tried that out, we found that that gave a similar failure profile to what we had seen before. Sometimes when you do it, you can get the entire cluster to lock up. And other times you get first to the follower, sorry, first the leader to lag behind, and then for the entire cluster to lock up. But after we had looked at uh, that a little bit more, we took a look at some of our metrics for disk latency, and we saw some logs that were being written at, at the same time, and we figured that this probably wasn't what, ha what was happening. Because for this to happen, it would have to take more than two minutes for us to write out this one meg file, and from from the metrics that we had seen, it just didn't seem like uh, that would, like, like that was happening. One of the annoying things during this outage was that the first warning that we had had that this problem was happening was general application level monitoring. So we all of our applications have lots of monitoring them in them, and they had some high level monitoring that would tell us just kind of things are slow or things are queuing up and we're not really making progress. And we didn't get a nice alert saying Zookeeper is having a problem. It was just things are bad. And then we would have to go and figure out that Zookeeper was the problem and then take this action to, to fix it. Now, these high-level application checks can be useful because they can catch lots of different problems. So when you have this kind of uh, alert that we did on things just you know queuing up and not really making much progress, that can catch problems if your database is down, if Zookeeper is down, if too many machines are down, any kind of problem like that. But it doesn't really give you a lot of information into what the actual problem is. And for that, we actually did have a little bit of monitoring on Zookeeper, uh, which, which we thought would have told us what was going on. This is uh, a command that you can send to Zookeeper. You can tell that to a certain port and send it the, this four-letter command, are you OK? And if it's working, then it sends back the, the string, I'm OK. And we actually ran this. But uh, Zookeeper was actually replying, I'm OK, on all these nodes. And by the way, the, the leader during all of these outages was still up. The, the process was still running. It was just that the cluster wasn't making any kind of progress. So what we ended up doing was we added a deeper health check to Zookeeper. Instead of just doing that simple check, uh, we did a still simple but a little bit uh, better check of just writing to one Zookeeper key and then reading from that Zookeeper key that we just wrote. And if we could do that, then we had this monitoring on the side saying that, yes, Zookeeper was OK. And this actually ended up giving us uh, quite a bit earlier warning than our regular application monitoring. When this happened again, and sadly the, this outage did happen again, our monitoring on Zookeeper told us pretty much right away that there was a problem that the cluster was freezing up. And then we had a little bit more time to investigate to figure out what was going on while the outage was happening. And when we did that, one of the pieces of information that we captured was a stack trace from the leader. This ended up telling us quite a bit about what was going on in the cluster. So this is on the leader. Um, at point one, we have uh, zkdatabase.serialize snapshot. This is the code where we are trying to send a snapshot from the leader to the follower. So in the case where the follower falls behind, it can't just catch up from the transaction logs from the, the leader. It just gets an entire snapshot of the database to then rejoin the cluster and be useful again. So on the leader, at point one, we're sending this snapshot to the follower. At point two, we are uh, serializing one individual data node. This is just an item in the database. And then at point three, and we, we have to take a we have to enter a synchronized block on that. So we're taking a lock on that item in the database while we're serializing it. And then at point three, we're doing a socket write. So we're writing over the network. And what we saw was that this thread was hung at this point for quite a while. I think it was a few minutes that we had waited to get another stack trace. And it was stuck at this point the entire time. 
Now, this actually tells us quite a bit about what was going on if you dig into the other threads that are on the, the leader for Zookeeper. So the way Zookeeper works is to process requests, it has kind of a chain of threads. So uh, you may have heard it called CEDA before, staged event-driven architecture. You have a chain of threads that will process the requests that are coming into Zookeeper. Uh, and we also have one thread per follower. These are called the, the learner handlers. And those are the ones that handle requests from other uh, Zookeeper instances. Now, when we need to send a snapshot to the follower, we go and we have to iterate over every item in the database, serialize it, and send it over the network. So we're entering synchronized blocks and then leaving synchronized blocks for every item in the database. But then at one point, for whatever reason we don't know yet, it hung and it would keep that lock on that individual item, that, this uh, synchronized block. Now, the problem is that these other threads that process requests, they also need that lock if you're doing an operation that, uh, that operates on that item. So if a request comes in, then our, our request processor threads need to take that lock as well. And by the way, these, these request processor threads do things like so first of all, receiving the, the data, they, uh, they write it out to disk, to the transaction log. Then later on, it will uh, replicate it out to the followers. And then the last step is applying it to your own in-memory copy of the data. So now we have one of these threads with the, the Java synchronized blocks and the lock on this one item. And then we have another thread in our request processor that is trying to take that lock as well. So when this happens, we just have a deadlock. And that's why the, the leader can't make any progress. But this also explains why we had these two different uh, manifestations of this failure. Because depending on what kind of operation you're performing, you might need to take a lock at the beginning of the re request processor chain, or, at the, or you might not need it till the very end. So if it was the kind of operation where you don't need it to the end, then you can still replicate that data out to all of the followers. You just can't update your own in-memory copy. So that's why we had the two different uh, ways that this failed. This is the, the snapshot uh, code that Zookeeper uses to serialize that data. What we have here is we have, we, we enter the synchronized block for the node. We call output.write string and output.write record. Those are the ones that could, that are writing over the network and could potentially block. And then we get a copy of the children. Remember, this is kind of a, a file system or a hierarchy. And then outside of that lock, that Java synchronized block, we go and we iterate over the children, and then we, we just recurse and call it again. And it's at that point, one of those output dot write string or write records that we're hanging. Now, we know most about what was going on, why this failure, or kind of what was happening with these two different failure cases. But there's still one other part that we don't know yet, which is, why didn't one of the followers take over? Zookeeper is a replicated system, so you have the leader and you have all these followers, and the followers are supposed to be able to take over if the leader isn't doing its job. We had done that manually by killing the leader and found that the, the cluster recovered, but we're not supposed to have to do it manually. Zookeeper is supposed to do it automatically for us. So the, the way that Zookeeper handles this is by having a heartbeat from the leader to the followers. When the followers get the heartbeat, then they know that everything is fine and they don't have to do anything. But if the followers don't get a heartbeat within a certain timeout, then they start an election, and then one of them should take over from the leader. And now, actually, at this point, if we look more at Zookeeper, we can figure out why this wasn't happening. Because going back to all these threads on the leader, we have the request processor chain, which is hung. We have the learner handler, which is blocked. But the thread that sends all these heartbeats is off on the side. So even though basically everything in, in the leader is stuck, we still have this one thread which is healthy enough to send out heartbeats to all the followers saying, you know, everything is fine, don't take over. And because of that, the leader process can still be up, but nothing actually happens. The, the leader isn't making progress. So we know most of what was going on, why we had these two different failure cases, why the follower, uh, why one of the followers wasn't taken 
taking over, but we still don't know why that uh, network write was hung for so long. So to figure out that, we need to dig into TCP behavior a little bit. Here we have a uh, connection from, uh, between the follower and the leader. And assume that we've already done, we've already established the connection, we've done the three-way handshake, and then the follower has requested a snapshot from the leader. Starting from that point, the leader would send a bit of data to the follower, and then the follower's kernel will reply with an act to let it know that it had it, that it, that it got it. But let's look at what happens if you have some sort of network problem. If you do, the leader sends the packet to the follower, it doesn't get back an acknowledgement, and then what happens is it will wait for a little while, and then it tries again. So this is the uh, TCP retransmission timeout, uh, and it is at least 200 milliseconds, but if you have a good connection, it'll be uh, pretty much 200 milliseconds. Now, if you still don't get the ACK, you try again using still 200 milliseconds, and then if you still don't get it, you start doubling the timeout. So now you wait 400 milliseconds, and then you try again. And then you wait 800, and you try again. And you go up to a maximum of 120 seconds and 15 different retries. And um, if you put all of that together, these are the, the values from, the, from Linux defaults, we have the retransmission timeout offset and, and the retries. When you add all that up, you end up getting 15 and a half minutes. So that's how long a socket write can block for if you have uh, a network partition in between them. And that's actually a lower bound. It could go higher if your TCP re retransmission timeout happened to be higher. Maybe you had like a little bit of network trouble before, and so it would have bumped it up. So during this whole time, 15 and a half minutes, if you're doing a socket write, it's going to be blocked for that entire time. Now, this is useful to know, and it was really surprising to me, but it's not quite what was happening, because for us, we had a few minutes where the network was really bad, but then after that, um, it, it was pretty much okay. So let's look over the, the timeline of what we saw happening. At point one, we had some sort of network problem. We had packet loss and latency. Number two, one of the followers would fall behind, and then it would restart, and it would request this snapshot from the leader. Number three, the leader begins to send the snapshot to the follower. Number four, the snapshot transfer falls. This is where we have that really bad uh, packet loss, and the, the socket write call is just hung. Number five, the follower zookeeper will restart because it couldn't get it in time. And because of that, the kernel will close the connection that it had open, or at least it will try to. And number six, this is just a few minutes later, the network heals. But at number seven, we found that the leader was still stuck and the cluster was still in a bad state. So to dig into why that was happening, we need to look at what happens when we close a connection and what, when uh, the network heals. So this is the regular um, clo TCP close connection starting from an established connection. When one side wants to close the connection, they send a fin packet to the other side. The other side replies back with a fin ack. And then once you get that, you, set, you reply back with an ack, and you set a timer for 60 seconds to wait for more packets to come through. And then after that 60 seconds, you consider the connection closed. And when the ack gets to the other side, the other side will con consider that connection closed as well. That's what normally happens. But let's look at what happens when you have a network partition in between. We have similar behavior to just sending regular packets, except it's a different configuration parameter for the number of retries. So when you're sending the fin packet, first you do a retry, again, it's a linear retry, and then you have eight retries. But then after that, if you still haven't heard anything back, you just mark the connection closed. And all that, if you work out the math on that one, it ends up being just a minute and 40 seconds. So if we combine those two together, you can see that if you tried to close a connection at the same time as another, the other side was trying to send you data, but you had a network partition, the one side will consider it closed after a minute and 40 seconds, but the other one takes 15 and a half minutes before it considers it closed. So during this time, if you were to run netstat on these two machines, maybe a couple minutes in, 
you would see that the follower had no idea about what was going on in this connection, but the leader still thinks that it's established. It doesn't even have any kind of warning or error state. It's just retrying packets, but from its perspective, the connection is still established. But we had said before that the network had healed after a few minutes, and TCP actually has a way of recovering from this. If you get a packet for a TCP connection that you don't know anything about, you're supposed to reply with a reset packet. This tells the other side that you don't know about the connection and they should stop trying. Once they get that reset packet, they'll mark their connection as closed. And we were only seeing half of this. We weren't seeing the reset packet going uh, back, but we were seeing that packet coming through on the follower. But the reason why we were seeing that packet come through is because it was being logged in syslog uh, by IP tables. This entry shows um, this is on the follower. We received a packet from the leader, and we dropped it. Because of that, the, the leader will keep on retrying. We keep on dropping that packet, and we don't uh, send back any, any reset. So they still think that it's established until they go through that really long 15 and a half or more uh, minute timeout. Now, the reason that we were dropping these packets, well, to, to find that reason, let's look at our firewall rules. This is a pretty typical IP tables firewall. First, you say that you want to accept any connections uh, for an established, sorry, any packets for an established connection or for uh, related, meaning if you're in the process of opening it or, or closing it, then you allow whatever uh, ports you want. And then at the end, you drop every other packet. So the reason that we were dropping this packet and not sending back the, the reset was because our IP tables um, firewall didn't know about that connection anymore. But one thing to keep in mind is that IP tables has its own way of keeping track of the state of the connection. So when you have that, uh, that rule at the beginning about established and related, IP tables starts tracking the state of the connection but it's completely separate from the regular kernel view where you use netstat. So you can run netstat and you can see one state of the connection, but when you run uh, contract, that's a, a tool to, to list the other ones, it will show it or it could show a different state of the connection because the IP tables view is done based on just a simple timeout. So in this case, when you send a fin packet, it sets a timer for 30 seconds. And then after that, it will consider the connection um, or it will forget about the connection and then drop any packets. But if you keep on sending fin packets, it'll keep on bumping up that 30 second timeout. So what you can end up with is on the follower, when you send the fin uh, packet to close it, the kernel view will take about a minute 40 or 100, uh, 102 seconds for it to mark it as closed and it'll be in fin wait that whole time. But IP tables can have this different view where it's setting these 30 second timeouts and it can actually forget about the connection after 80 seconds. So with this case, if you ran netstat at the 90 second mark, you would see that uh, you still had a connection. It would be in fin wait. But if you received a packet, IP tables would drop it saying that it wasn't, with, uh, it wasn't related to any established connection. So now we know quite a bit more about what was happening. Starting from, we have some packet loss. One of the followers will fall behind, and it requests a snapshot. The packet loss continues, and then the follower closes the, the TCP connection. After a little while, the follower's connection tracking module uh, will forget about the connection. And now at this point, the leader is stuck, because the, or the, the leader's connection is stuck, and then the leader zookeeper as well, is stuck for about 15 minutes, even if the network heals after that point. So now, because we know about uh, this, uh, what we know more about what happened, we can reproduce it. So the, the way that we can reproduce it, first we want to make the follower fall behind. So we can use this command, tcqdisk. This will add uh, 500 milliseconds of latency, plus or minus a random amount from 0 to 100 milliseconds, as well as 35% packet loss. So you can add that, or run that on the follower, wait for a few minutes, and it'll cause it to fall behind. And actually, an easier way of doing that is just killing the follower process 
but this gives a nice excuse for showing a useful command and there's nowhere else that I can really put it, so I used it here. Um, so we actually, uh, so we, we have the follower, uh, they've fallen behind the rest of the cluster. Next, what we can do is we can uh, remove the, that latency and packet loss from the follower and instead add a bandwidth restriction. So those are the commands in the middle there, the, the qdisk add commands. Next, we can start the follower zookeeper process again, and then it's going to request a snapshot from the, whoops, it's going to request a snapshot from the leader. Um, yeah, but, uh, wait, request a snapshot, yeah. So, um, what we want to do though is now we're in the, we're in the middle of sending that snapshot. So what we want to do is we want to pause it right then so we can block the traffic to the leader and then remove that bandwidth restriction that we added. So now at this point, the, the transfer has been started. It's right in the middle. You still have an established connection on both sides. So we can kill the follower and then the follower will try to close that TCP connection and we can just wait for a little while and we've blocked traffic. So you can monitor this at this point using uh, this contract dash L you can see what the state of the IP tables connection view is. And so after about 80 seconds, you'll see that go away. And at that point, you can allow traffic to the, to the leader again. If you ran netstat at this point, for a short period of time, you would still see that connection on the follower. Um, but the IP tables has already forgotten about it. So any packets that are coming through will be dropped and it won't send that reset connection back. So now at the end of this, we allow traffic to the leader and we have a completely healthy network, but you have a TCP connection that is completely stuck. So this, uh, this works to reproduce it. Now, everything up until this point has been pretty general. It applies to just kind of TCP behavior on Linux and, uh, and what happens in Zookeeper. But there is one other part of our setup that's a little bit, uh, a little bit rare, which made this slightly more likely to occur. It would still occur without this, but this made it just a little bit more likely. And that's with IPsec. I'm curious, how many people are using IPsec in production? Show of hands, like five, five and a half. Um, IPsec uh, encrypts all of the traffic between your machines. So it can be pretty useful because instead of having to configure each individual application, to enable encryption or that kind of stuff for each one, or if it didn't support it, then having to set up S-Tunnel or something like that. Instead, you can just enable IPsec and all the traffic between the machines will be encrypted. The way that this works is anytime you want to send data, TCP or UDP data, whatever, it will first be uh, encrypted by the IPsec uh, code and then it will be sent as this ESP packet, encapsulating security payload. And this is, uh, you can send those kinds of packets over TCP, but you, it's much more common to send them over UDP. And it may seem weird to take TCP data and then send it over UDP data, or and send it over UDP, but really it's okay because we've already seen that TCP handles that kind of uh, packet loss. So if it has encapsulated that, uh, that TCP data and it gets dropped, well, at the TCP level, it'll retry it and it'll just get sent again. Now, I won't go into detail about uh, this handshake, but just enough to, to show that before you can talk to another machine with IPsec, you have to do this, uh, this, uh, these two different handshakes to negotiate an encryption key. And that ends up being four round trips to do it. Now, while this is going on, uh, so that this happens right when you first try to send TCP data or just establish a TCP connection to a machine that you haven't talked to in a while. Now, while this is going on, while it's trying to establish the connection, we still have that TCP data that we wanted to send. And you might think initially that, like, you know, you, you might automatically assume that we would just buffer that TCP data up and then send it all right at the end. But we don't need to do that because TCP handles packet loss it is correct just to drop that packet on our side before we've even attempted to send it and let TCP retry while we're trying to establish that connection. So that's what IPsec does. It, uh, 
it will just drop that data until it has a connection. Now, the other part to know is that uh, IPsec also has a heartbeat that it uses. So with uh, this is different from TCP. With TCP, you don't have any heartbeat. If you establish a connection with another machine, you could leave it open for days, not send any data back and forth, and it would still be considered established on the other end. And it would only be kind of routers that are in the middle that would really interfere with you being able to do that. But IPsec has a heartbeat that it sends fairly frequently. And if it doesn't get that heartbeat, at least with uh, enough, uh, enough times, it will tear down the entire connection, and then you have to reestablish the connection from scratch. And again, during all that time, any TCP data that you're trying to send is going to be dropped uh, on, on your side before you even try to send it across the network. So the end effect of this is that if you have high packet loss, not 100% packet loss, but just high packet loss, it can be very difficult to keep up an IPsec connection to the other side. And so this will turn high packet loss into effectively 100% packet loss because you can't establish an IPsec connection, so you won't try to send any at all. And by the way, this, uh, this kind of messes with the, the retries of TCP as well, because TCP has the, the back off that we've seen of if you, haven't, uh, if you haven't got acknowledgement of what you've sent, you retry it with some increasing back off. But if you don't have that IPsec connection established at all, then it means that all the quick retries that you've done are dropped before they've even be, been sent over the wire. And it's only later on when you have uh, these rare ones that you might be trying a bit more and actually sending them if you could even get that IPsec connection going in the first place. Now, there are, I think, a lot of lessons that you can take away from this. One of them is that this stuff is really complex and you have to really keep on digging and be really persistent to figure out what's going on. But I also have a few um, probably more practical lessons. The first one is that you shouldn't take a lock and perform a potentially blocking operation. This was kind of the, um, the, the key part that caused Zookeeper to stall. It's that we were, take, we were entering a Java synchronized block, and then we were performing a net network write, and that write can block for a really long time, 15 and a half minutes, or even longer. Now, one interesting uh, thing that I noticed while I was kind of doing this analysis is that interfaces and abstract methods can make this harder to reason about. In the Zookeeper code, that uh, output stream that we were writing to, or it, it's a, not an output stream, but it's a, their own uh, output class, that was actually an interface that you, uh, that you use, where you call write record or um, write string to perform the network operation. And it just happened to be that the implementation writes over the network and that that can block for a really long time. Now, I don't think it made a difference in this instance, but it's very easy to imagine a situation where you write some code, you enter a Java synchronized block, and then you call an interface or another abstract method. And at the time you write that, the only implementations of it are non-blocking. They just do something in memory. But then later on, someone could add a new implementation that could block and then all of a sudden your original code is incorrect. The other lesson for this is that it would have been helpful to have automatic uh, debugging, info, uh, debugging info collection. So things like stack traces, heap dumps for databases, transaction logs, or other things like that. We were only able to figure out what was going on after we had this stack trace of a hung um, Java process for the, the Zookeeper leader. Now, before this had happened, we didn't have any automated collection of this, and we, we didn't get it at all. We were stuck kind of looking through logs, which were done at the info level, and then you have to do that annoying reasoning of, okay, this method couldn't have been hit because it logs at the info level, and I didn't see that. Um, and it's just really annoying to try to have to use that limited information to figure out what was going on. It would be much better if we had uh, these this extra information, stack traces, and things like that. And in an outage situation, it can be hard to remember to collect them, so it's useful to make that uh, just happen kind of automatically. The other one is that the health checks that you're using should be at least a little bit deeper than probably what you are using of just the basic, you know, is this port open or that kind of thing. 
Anytime your application has a dependency on other things like a database or a third-party service, if you want to make sure that that service is working, it's useful to perform more of a real request to it rather than just the most basic one. So in the case of Zookeeper, we did an actual write and then a read. Um, I know for a lot of databases, people use kind of just a, you know, a select one query, but that one doesn't even hit the disk. So it doesn't go through a lot of the normal stuff that a database would have to use. It's possible that your database can respond to that query, but can't respond to real queries. So anytime you have these dependencies, uh, first of all, it's useful to have something on the side separate from your application, monitoring whether it's, whether it's healthy, and to have it just be you know, a little bit deeper than you might otherwise think to do. Now, the, the other thing, which is applicable more to just kind of distributed systems in general, which I think is a pretty big problem, is that anytime you have this kind of leader follower based system, uh, if you're using heartbeats or some other health check like that to prevent followers from taking over or from trying to take over and become a leader, if on the leader you do anything less than check to make sure that you would actually be able to process requests, you know, hitting disk, doing all the things that you need to do, then you can end up in a situation like this, where the only thing that's healthy is a thread telling the other, um, the other followers that you're still healthy, even though you can't actually do anything. And that's pretty much the worst thing that you can be doing in a distributed system, is not doing your job, but telling all the other people who could do your job not to do it either. Um, I forgot if I mentioned this, but uh, the, this is fixed in the latest version of Zookeeper. The fix that we applied um, was, we picked a pretty simple one. Back in that, uh, in that synchronized block, instead of writing over the network while we, had, while we were in that Java synchronized block, we instead took an in-memory copy of the data, and then outside of the block, we still write to the network. So that's a very simple fix, which means that then you're not blocking um, or you're, you're not taking a, a lock that other threads need, so you wouldn't end up causing it to deadlock. And there are other things that you can do as well that, uh, that would make this a lot less likely to happen. So thank you all for listening. One uh, quick thing I'll leave up here. These are all the commands that I uh, showed in this presentation, as well as a bunch of other ones that are pretty useful. Yeah, you can take pictures if you really want them right now. I'll also post the slides a little bit later. So, does anyone have any questions? Um, yep. Uh, obviously, the, the heartbeat mechanism in Zookeeper is not very useful because, as you mentioned, it does not really check whether it's still healthy. Um, is that being fixed? Or have you I don't know, filed a bug report or patch or anything? Yep, so the, the question is that the, the health check in Zookeeper uh, that ha or it, that's, that's not very good, and has that been fixed? So, um, yep, I, I agree that it's not really good. I think that a lot of other distributed systems have a similar thing like that, where they don't do a real health check before sending out that heartbeat to prevent other people from doing it. So I think a lot of distributed systems should change to that. Um, I don't think that has been fixed, uh, but I do have plans to fix it. I should probably just open a ticket, because I've been planning for a long time and have never done it. Um, any other questions? Yep. How do we automate the debug info collecting? Um, so for Zookeeper, at least, we've done most of the work of automating it, where we just have a single, uh, a single script that you can run, which will take a, a stack trace. It'll take a heap dump. So to get a stack trace, you can just run jstack or do a kill dash three, and it'll send it to a standard out. Heap dump as well, you can just run a command to get a heap dump. We also copy over, in the case of Zookeeper, it has transaction logs that it writes. Um, the, I think they call it a commit log there. We take a copy of that, because that can also be used to, to determine when it was doing things and what it was doing. Um, so in our case, we haven't gone, or we, we haven't been able to just completely automate it of any time there's an outage, take it but we have it at least at the step of a single command will grab all the useful information that we need. More questions? Yep. So in the beginning, you mentioned introducing uh, a lock on top of Cassandra. Yep. Can you elaborate a bit on the use case and if you consider something, something else apart from locks for that? Because that sounds like super dangerous to me. 
Okay, so uh, elaborate on the use of locks when we're interacting with Cassandra. So we, we do that to deal with some of the consistency issues of Cassandra. What we do is typically um, we, we lock at either it, uh, a pretty fine grain level. So usually it's either all the data related to a user or separate from that, um, just one individual database entity. And so we, we take a lock and then we operate on it and then we give up that lock. Now the, the use case is there is to prevent other machines in our system from trying to concurrently operate on that because Cassandra doesn't have real transactions. So if you did have two things that were trying to operate on that, uh, that database entity, you could end up with, you know, you, you wrote five different columns and three of the columns from this write are the one that won and two of the columns from this write are the one that won. There are also uh, clock skew issues in Cassandra. If you do have clock skew, well, you, you always have clock skew, but if you have clock skew that is bad enough compared to network latency, then you can end up with a lot of weird things like a write that claimed it was successful, but really it didn't go through because it was ordered before another write, at least with the timestamp, even though it happened later in real time. And Cassandra will resolve it just based on the timestamp that it has. So it is possible to read an item in Cassandra modify it, write it out, and then have that write be completely lost, even though it tells you it got it. So a simple trick that we use with, uh, with our locking is because you have to take this lock first, um, we know that no two people are concurrently updating it, but also uh, after you're done doing whatever modifications you have and you've sent them to Cassandra, we actually have a thread.sleep before we give up that lock. That means that we can wait out um, this clock skew. So we can have what I think our default is waiting 50 or 100 milliseconds afterwards. So we can have clock skew of half that amount because one could be ahead, one could be behind. Does that uh, answer your question? Yep, cool. Any other questions? Yep. Um, did you consider using uh, network connection and read write timeouts? Oh, did we consider using network connection, read write timeouts? I should have mentioned this in the presentation. Um, there is a socket read timeout. So when you're, you're reading from a socket on a per socket basis, you can set a timeout. There is no socket write timeout for a regular blocking IO. You just can't set one. It's just done indirectly by these kernel parameters of the number of retries that you have when you don't get acknowledgement for the data that you've write. You can't set any socket option saying, I only want to wait this amount of time for a write to happen. And yet, yep. Wouldn't there have been another way to impose those, those kind of timeouts? Would there be another way to impose those kind of timeouts? Um, yeah, so for example, if you used uh, NIO, you can use non-blocking IO, and then you're, you, can, you can do whatever check you want about how long you're willing to wait for a read or how long you're, you're willing to wait for a write. In Zookeeper, uh, it's a really old project. They were using regular blocking IO. And on top of that, regular blocking IO can be a lot easier to read. So you don't know if, you know, if they re-implemented it with NIO, maybe they would have other bugs of like error handling or things like that. So it's a trade-off there. But with regular blocking IO, you can't specify any, uh, any write timeout. Any other questions? Yep. The, the, the leader is down for 15 minutes writing something. Shouldn't the help thread say something about that? If the leader is down for 15 minutes when it's writing something, shouldn't the health threads? So do you mean the, uh, the, heartbeat on the heartbeat thread on the leader that's writing? Yep. Yep, so that, that would be ideal if it did some sort of monitoring of the health of things and knew that it wasn't, uh, wasn't doing it, but it, it doesn't. But that, that is another thing that ought to be fixed as well, yeah. Okay. There's a lot of things that should be fixed. So like we, we, we did the, the simplest fix of don't do a blocking write in the, in the synchronized block. There should also be some, some work done on the heartbeat mechanism there. And on top of that, it would be nicer if we tuned some of these parameters or made some of these parameters tunable so that you didn't have to have this 15 minute wait for, uh, for doing a network write. It would be nicer if we could, well, what, what I would like to do is keep the number of retries that you do the same or even bump it up but lower that 120 second maximum uh, retransmission timeout, have that be configurable so you can lower it 
and then you can you can it would still be indirect but you would be able to tune with that and say that you know we only want to keep this connection open for 30 seconds worth of time rather than 15 minutes or even higher any other questions oh yep did we change something in ip tables what do you mean Oh, uh, did we change something to have the with the the contract module not being aligned with the regular kernel view? I think that would be a really involved change. I think it's uh, mostly for historical reasons that I think IP tables used to live outside of the kernel, but now a lot more of it lives in the kernel. So maybe it didn't have access to that before. Um, it would be nicer if it did that because as it is right now, IP tables just has simple timeouts. It doesn't know about the real TCP state machine. So it would be nice if it knew about the real TCP state machine, but that would be a huge amount of work to do. It would be nice if someone did it, though. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yep. Would it be better to use UDP instead of TCP? I mean, it would prevent this uh, problem, but then you have to deal with ordering yourself. Um, yeah, so it... Uh, I mean, UDP versus TCP, it's, it's a trade-off. You wouldn't just get something for free by doing that. But it would be an option. Yep. Are you, you now use IP sync? I'm not sure how things like OpenCPM with Stupendia set up, because that's also one of those network layers that can do your encryption and use UDP. Is it possibly the same? Do you, do you know? So the question is about uh, IPsec. Uh, how it op versus, uh, and what was the other one, sorry? OpenVPN? Versus OpenVPN? Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yep. How long did it take to figure this out? <laughs> how long did it take to figure all this out? Um, something like a few months worth of uh, man time. Like two or three ish worth of time, not just my time. There was uh, other people at PageDB as well who were investigating this. Yeah, but I I learned a lot, so I'm I'm very happy that I did this investigation. I didn't know nearly as much about uh, TCP before. Yep. So where did most of the time go to uh, investigating Java code versus TCP? The vast majority of time was spent um, not making much progress. <laughs> so uh, before we had this stack trace, so once we had the stack trace, it was pretty quick to figure everything else out. Because we had spent so much time going over the Zookeeper code base, we even were kind of grasping at straws. We started reading the, there are a couple of papers on the consensus algorithms that Zookeeper uses. We were going through trying to figure out flaws in that. Um, yeah, pouring over the, the code base, pouring over logs, trying to figure out what was going on, trying to like reason about what, what might have happened. Um, so the vast majority of time was just kind of investigating that stuff and learning the Zookeeper code base uh, and all of that. And then once we had had the stack trace, because we already knew about, like we already had these diagrams that we drew on the whiteboard all the time about the threads on the leader and the threads on the follower, we already knew that. So then it was quite quick um, to go from that to figuring out um, what was going on there and then just a bit more time of experimenting with TCP to figure out exactly what these timings were. And I did that mostly out of curiosity. Like we pretty, pretty early on, or after we had done that, a lot of that learning stuff, we got the stack trace, and then pretty early on after that, we knew what we could do to fix it, but I dug a little bit more to figure out kind of what exactly was going on. Any other questions? No? Okay, thank you all very much.